Today I want to speak to you, as I have been for a, for a little while talking about Revelation and the messages to the seven churches. John was given uh, or instructed to write these messages to the seven churches of Asia Minor, which is in, today in modern day Turkey. The message to Laodicea uh, was one of judgment and a call for repentance. In fact, when we look at the messages sent to the other six churches, we saw hopeful things, we saw good things, we saw things that God called out that He thought was good but was asking them to fix other things that weren't so good. In Laodicea, we haven't seen that. Uh, it was, the, the message was not a good one. And so brethren, uh, let's get started, right? Turn with me to Revelation chapter 3, and we'll read from verse 14. As we look at this, the message to the Laodicean church. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. And we know this is speaking of Jesus. He's a faithful witness. He, Jesus, when he was here uh, on this earth, he... He said he would give his life uh, to save this world. He did. Uh, he said he would be raised from the grave after three days. He was raised from the grave. And today we know he's alive. And he sent this message back to the Laodicean church, the faithful witness. He said in verse in 15, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I will thou were cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Interesting. See, Jesus is, is saying here, I know your works. Laodicea was a very big city and we're going to get into that a little bit but notice what he's saying here I know thy works you need a hot nor cold that is interesting it means that they weren't taking any real position on anything they weren't taking any position on anything and that's that's very interesting because some believe that we are living in the Laodicean age. These messages were for different time period. And so we are living in the period of the Laodicean. Whatever the case is, we know that this is a very striking message to that particular place in Turkey. Laodicea. Of the seven churches. This one was the southernmost of all the seven churches. And so we know where that place is. That place is in ruin today. And if we remember the messages, God is saying to these churches, I will take away your candlestick if you do not change your ways. Laodicea was lukewarm. Can this message be um, just, I find it interesting how the message is describing them. Is it possible then that the message is drawn from a condition that existed in the city? A little bit of background on that and you can check it out yourself. Laodicea was a city without its own water supply. It had an underground aqueduct that would carry water into the city uh, and it would be like 17 miles to bring that water into the city. By the time 
uh, it got into the city, it was lukewarm. And this water was taken from the hot springs, and it was good for healing purposes and so forth. By the time the water got into the city, it was lukewarm. So it was not good anymore. It wasn't cold and refreshing, neither was it hot or good for the purpose for which it was brought into the city. Jesus was basically describing this church just as the water that was brought into the city. Luke warm. It was not good anymore. This was a spiritual condition that existed in the church and needed to be addressed. I find it very interesting that Jesus sending this message or giving this message to John. We got to remember what Revelation 1 says. God gave that message to Jesus. Jesus gave it to his angel. The angel gave it to John. And here John is writing this letter as he wrote everything down that we read in Revelation to this particular church. If it is true that we are living in this Laodicean age, we need to take notice today, brethren. We truly need to take notice. Because the Lord was saying here that they were lukewarm. They weren't. Basically, sometimes we use the saying, going through the motion. We come to church, but not all there. We come to church as a practice or as a habit without any real commitment to anything. And they did this in Laodicea. But they were caught up in the things around them. It was a very wealthy city, very big city. Like Toronto, a city of over three million people. And many cities around the world today, in the millions, Yet God is saying in this message, I know your works. You think we can be identified among the millions of people in this city? Among the millions of people in this country? If a message should be sent and God say, I know your works, will you be happy? Is the work good? If it is not, Take notice from this church, the practices. In verse 17, Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, miserable, poor, and blind, and naked, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye slav, that thou mayest see. I said before, Laodicea was a wealth, wealthy town, very big city. It had a banking center, there was a time when the city was destroyed by a, a massive earthquake in AD 60. The Romans offered help to help them rebuild the city. They re rejected the financial assistance and they built it, rebuilt on their own. They were able to do that financially. They were rich. The city was famous for soft black wool that it produced. So it, it had a factory um, that produced clothes. It had a medical school. And it was famous for the eye medication, the eye slab, as we read in here. So it was a very uh, prominent pronounced very rich uh, place. But here Jesus is saying, 
um, in, in this, despite all the riches. You see how much they trusted in the things that they had? It said, because thou sayest, I am rich and increased in good and have need of nothing. It's, it's, isn't it amazing? We always say, the rich do not seem to have faith. You know, when Jesus preached on this earth, it was the poor people that was always following him, that was willing to listen to him, having faith in the promises that they will not remain in that state. There is a better place, a city with roads paved in gold. Men fight and kill for it today, and we'll be walking on it. A city paved with gold. So, interesting how these very same conditions, these um, things that they trusted in, Jesus brought to the forefront. It says um, they had, uh, they were rich, um, and what he said here, I counsel thee to buy gold, tried in fire. Uh, that thou, thou mayest be rich. Oftentimes we say the things that we trust in in this world are the only temporal. Uh, we, we know they're good. Many of these things are good for us. But they're only temporal. And here, um, these conditions came into play in the warning to the Laodicean church. It says um, here, they were rich, um, they had the water, um, was not good, it was um, lukewarm. The, the riches that they trust in, whether it's their, their manufacturing or their medical school or their financial system, Jesus brought all that into play as he counseled them. Your riches will not deliver you, he's saying. Because this is what he's saying. They're miserable. They're poor. And despite the clothes that they had and the, the ability to manufacture their own clothes, Jesus is offering them clothing. He's saying, he wants to cover their nakedness. And we know nakedness is a symbol of unrighteousness. And so white garment also a symbol of righteousness. Right? As the, as the verse is saying here, it says, I counsel thee to buy gold, tried and fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed. Jesus wants to clothe them with righteousness. White raiment, a symbol of righteousness. Let's look at this. In Revelation 7 and verse 9, as we cover the righteous garment, let's understand what I'm saying. After this I beheld and lo a great multitude which no man could number of all nation, kindred, and people, and tongue stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. 7.13 And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes? And whence came they? And, he, and I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. He said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. See, the, the garment that the saints must be clothed in, you see the garments that Jesus was offering to the Laodiceans? Not to trust in the clothes that they wear, but in the inner garment of our very righteousness that must be uh, appear before God. This is what he was talking about. Another verse that talks about that, Revelation 19 verse 7, 
Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the Lamb is come and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. See? We will, Jesus will have use for us, my brethren, in the future, but we need to be clothed with his righteousness. The Laodiceans trusted in their ability, their wealth, and not trusting so much in God. They lost faith in God. And so the warning to them is to change their ways. Change your ways. If not, right? Your nakedness will appear before men. I will uncover your shame. You know, the city was eventually destroyed and never rebuilt. It is under rubble today. Later, sometime around 160 AD, another massive earthquake hit that place, never to be rebuilt all the monuments and some of the stadiums, the robbers are still there to show, yes, they had all these things, but not anymore. The city is abandoned. Nobody lived there today. Nobody lived there. And you think, with such a progressive city, with its banking system, and we know it's situ it was situated on a fault line that was really bad for it as well. And so it, 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 earthquake was a normal thing for them. But these were a really terrible earthquake, exposing their weaknesses in their ability to refinance themselves and rebuild their, their town for themselves. In AD 60, we see that they refused assistance. Well, they did not change their ways. They did not want to uh, make that decision to be hot to God or make that decision to follow Him. The very thing that they trusted in were destroyed mm -hmm. in that earthquake. They weren't able to rebel. Sometimes that can happen in life, my brethren. We can become so independent we can become so um, self-confident and think that we do not need anyone in our lives. We do not need friends. We do not need assistance. We can do it all, all on our own. And sometimes all it takes is an accident or some kind of a sickness or disease. And we can lose everything and you know the very friends and assistance that we refuse uh, can it can really come back to hurt us so the, 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 the message here for us is to trust in God not in our own selves nakedness I said before is a symbol of unrighteousness and I want us to see that so Nahum 3 and verse 4 um, it reads in Nahum 3, Because of the multitude of their holdings, of the well-favored harlot, the mistress of witchcraft that selleth nations through her holdings, and families through her witchcraft, behold, I am against thee, saith the Lord of hosts, I will discover thy skirt upon thy face, I will show the nations thy nakedness, and the kingdoms thy shame. Verse 6. And I will cast abominable, abominable filth upon thee and make thy vile, make thee vile, and will set thee as a gazing stock. God is able to do that. God is, was able to do that to Nineveh. God, you know, that's what happened when we come, become so independent mm -hmm. and think we do not need God. When a nation thinks they do not need God, when a nation stand up and say, we're atheists, there's no such thing as God, well, God will not be there for them. 
God will discover the nakedness. Nineveh found that out. In Revelation 18, verse 2, Revelation 18, 2, And he carried, cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and is become the habitation of devils, and the hole of every foul spirit, and a cave of every unclean and hateful bird. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of a fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are wax rich food, the abundance of her delicacies. Listen, brethren, this is a warning. In verse 4, it says to come out of her, my people. We cannot become wrapped up in idol worship. We cannot become wrapped up in, in, in things that are contrary to God. And we know many practices that have been baptized and made spiritual that people worship today. Laodicea was famous for the idol worship. Zeus, right? Um, famous for um, building the statues and bowing down and worship. God said that, you know, nakedness, it, it, it's a terrible thing. And the Lord is saying, Babylon is fallen. We see in Nahum. How God said that he will expose the weakness in Nineveh. Discover her, her nakedness. Babylon is falling. Revelation 18.4 saying, come out of her mind people. Laodicea was called upon to change their ways. Give up idol worship. Be hot to God. And God is promising to welcome them, accept them. That's the same message we have today. The, the book of Revelation is the last day warning, right? It is, we're told there in chapter one, it's a message to show the people of God and to show this world things that must shortly come to pass. Laodicea and modern day Turkey had this gospel that we preach today. They had the temples that was later dedicated to idol worship. They had the apostles traveling in these places, teaching, warning, correcting, uplifting. They, John was banished from the Isle of Patmos Paul and all these men, we read them in, in Colossians, how Paul wrote letters to these places and to brethren in these places. Where are they today? Where's Laodicea today? Where's Ephesus today? Hmm? Where's Sardis today? All these places were in Turkey that had the gospel. Did you know all of Europe had this gospel? How come they don't have it anymore? What happened? They've given themselves over to idol worship. They are worshiping that fallen church. Babylon is fallen. And God would one day discover their nakedness. He will show them how weak they are. We see financial meltdown recently. You know, people, we, we begin to trust in our riches. Trust in our ability, trust our doctors to keep us healthy. They had that in Laodicea. They had the doctors, they had the uh, factories, they had the banking system, they had it all. One of the richest of the seven churches, the seven cities that is mentioned in Revelation chapter 2 to chapter 3, yet today, they're not. Robert, Kerry and Amersa recently traveled there and they showed us photos of that place. The stadiums that they had. Some of the walls are still standing, some of the streets are broken up but they're still there to show how expanded that city was. 
large expansion, and we think, I think of Toronto, we think of a city like New York. Well, I mean, there are so many big cities today, and they are all very rich. And God is calling them out today not to trust in uncertain riches. And we should not trust in uncertain riches as well. Here are some practices that can bring about lukewarmness. We have to be very careful about these. Take note of them. Remember that. They're good for me. They're good for you. And everyone that trusts in God, they're good for you as well. So take note on these. 1 John 2 verse 15. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And we know Laodicea trusted in the worldly things. They trusted in garments. They trusted in beauty. Same as we see in the world today. Fashion. Fashion and fashion. It, it, it changes every time. It's a new phone. Oh, I got a newer phone. It's a new computer. I got a smaller and faster one. Right? It's, it's just so many things that we think we must have that is so important and we we have to boast about it we have to brag I got a bad one mm -hmm. really so go out and buy the new one because he just got the last one that was last year's version see the new iPhone coming out already it is said that hey don't think this is a big deal there are new ones coming out. So maybe hold out a little longer. We're told that we'll be able to do all of our businesses on our phone, whether it's pump gas, do grocery. Our phone will be the way of life going forward. Banking, everything will be on our phone. And you know, we come to trust in these things. And everyone competes with the other one, the, the newer one, the better one. That was the problem in Laodicea, and it came into the church. And so the church allowed the world to step in, and it was like a competition between the church and the world. And so once this problem came into the church, it brought lukewarmness, right? And it probably brought contention as well. Because some didn't like what was happening, and some think it was okay. And then everybody thought, oh wow, whatever. Who cares? That was the condition in Laodicea. Lukewarm. And these are some of the things that can bring about lukewarmness. Verse 16 says, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And guess what happened? The world passeth away, and the lust thereof. Guess who survives? Those that do the will of God abideth forever. See? See the new Jerusalem in Revelation 19, as we just read, 7 and 8? The righteousness of the saints is used to adorn the city. Those that survive. Those that did not allow themselves to be caught up with the fashion and the things of this world. They pass away. If you don't believe me, take Laodicea for an example. Take Ephesus for example. Take all these places that once ruled the world for example. How they pass away. And you know what? They're used as, you know, tourist attraction. This is what it used to be. Oh no, we don't know what it used to be. We just have the history of it. But these are the remains of it, really. The remains only, you see. And this is what um, John is saying here. The lust passed away. The world and the things that are in the world that we lust after, that we pride ourselves against, 
uh, they all passed away. Hear what Matthew, Jesus is speaking now. Matthew chapter 6. Uh, Matthew 6, was that verse 24? I think so. 24. No man can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. He cannot serve God and man on. Or money. Alright? Money is good. We all know it. I work. I get a wage. I look for it every time. Sometimes you want a raise. Alright? I work hard and I, I need a raise, you know. I want to have this too. Okay? It's good. And we heard this here before. Money is a good servant, but a poor master. If we control it, it is a servant to us. If we allow it to control us, it is not very good in mastering itself or doing anything good for us. It's, it's a poor master. It leads us to destruction. Right, so there's absolutely nothing wrong with wealth. But we cannot trust in it and think it will give us life. Because eternal life is in Christ. Wealth, it doesn't matter how much money we have, the rich and the poor go to the same place. There's no discrimination in death. But we can plan for it. Some devote their money to life insurance. You know, I'm going to set up myself well and have life insurance. Really, there's nothing wrong with that. But it's a better way. Right? We can set up ourselves in Christ and have life assurance. Be assured of it. That if we are in Christ and we die, we will live again. If you're not in Christ and you have your life insurance, you don't get to spend it. Your children and grandchildren spend it or squander it. But if it is connected to Christ, we we'll walk on streets of gold. See? We we'll see the fruits of it, we're like, wow, you can walk and go now. Right? You see some people in this world today, the rich and how they live. We don't have to envy those. Hear what Corinthians say. Let me try and get through this with you. Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 6. And I was talking about things that can bring about lukewarmness. Okay? So if we allow ourselves to be controlled by money, uh, what we, we find ourselves doing at times is um, maybe not being faithful to God in paying of our tithes. Or we, we squander um, our money and think, I gotta have a phone, I gotta have this, I gotta have fashion, I gotta have everything that comes up, I gotta have it. Why? Because my friend have it. And if I'm walking down the street with him or her, you know, we gotta look compatible. And so we have to be careful that we're not controlled by the things of this world. 2 Corinthians 6. Be not, verse 14. Unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord with hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God, as God has said. I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separated, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. 
See, we cannot be confirmed to this world. We cannot be entangled with the things of this world. I think we all smart enough to understand what Paul is saying here. The, the thing is, my brother, if these things take root in our lives, our spiritual lives will be destroyed as did the city Laodicea, which lies in ruins today. That city was destroyed, so would our spiritual lives will be destroyed. Uh, let me look at um, Romans with me, and uh, I'll try and get through this one, these verses quickly with you. Romans. Romans uh, 12. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. See, we just cannot be conformed. We have to be transformed to understand what the will of God is. In Jude 1, 20, be, but ye beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. Jude verse 20, verse 21, uh, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And the same have passion, making a difference. And others safe with fear, pulling them, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garments spotted by the flesh. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling, and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Lord, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. So, we, we need to hold on to God. We need to trust in Him. We need to have that faith in Him. Uh, I just want to touch on one more point and then wrap this up. Uh, as we go back and Laodicea, and how God was pleading with that church to stand up, be either heart or hope. Luke 1, we all know what, you know, sometimes you want something cold and refreshing. If it is lukewarm, it's not good. It's, you just won't continue drinking it. Um, and so it is, if you want something hot, you may want a hot tea or, or chocolate. You don't want it lukewarm, you want it hot. That's what God wants from us. Here, what it, the, the last verse is in Revelation 3, verse 19, 19. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come to him and will sup with him and he with me. I find that interesting. How much he is throwing at them, how much he is throwing at us, right? Repent, <coughs> saying to the Laodicean church. And if it is true that we are living in that age, we're called to repentance. Because that was the call to Laodicea. It was one of judgment and repentance. So, repent is saying. And this, he said, I am, I'm at the door. If you open, I will come in to you. You with me. Right? And he said, to him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. Interesting. Brother, what have we learned from the Laodicea church? They took pride in the financial wealth, yet the Lord told them to buy gold refined in fire, that they may be rich. 
Laodicea took pride in clothing, yet the Lord told them to buy white garment that they may be clothed, that the shame of their nakedness may not be revealed. They took pride in their medical school, yet the Lord told them to anoint their eyes with ice life that they may see. He was still seeing them blind. Right? He's offering them something better. Have we learned anything? Let us not go in the path that the Laodicean brethren and that city went. Not only was the church displaced, but the city was destroyed. We do not want to find ourselves in that condition when Jesus comes. We want to be caught up with him. This, this city and its people will be displaced. God's people will be reunited and to be with him forever. Let us be part of that number. God bless you. Amen.